Welcome again. We're back for more online world history. And this week's our topic is going to be the Italian Renaissance. So we're going to be talking about uh, what the Renaissance is, where it comes from. Uh, we'll get to talk about it in terms of politics and society, but especially we're going to be talking about the ideas of the Renaissance and what comes out of this. I know those of you who are art fans are going to you know, yay, we got lots of happy little fun uh, pictures to look at, so we'll be talking about that, some of the important influences that this has uh, on society going forward, but also, too, we're going to be talking about its political impact on monarchies and the papacy here in uh, Europe. Okay, if you look at the, the Renaissance and where it kind of comes from, uh, why is it that the northern Italian city-states, you know, why is it that it's the 1400s or so? Well, you had a number of serious social upheavals in the 12 and 1300s, right, in the 13th and the 14th centuries, and they begin to recede by the late 1300s. We'd had the Black Death, we'd had peasant revolutions, we'd had a number of problems that had taken place. And so these people of northern Italy, from about 1400 onward, they begin to notice a lot of the classical ideas of the Greco-Roman period, and those began to resurface. They began to get reincorporated into a lot of these um, artistic works at this time, and it's historians that have labeled this period Renaissance, which is a French term for rebirth. This is the historian Jacob Burkhart, who, yeah, I know there's not much to look at, but then again, you got to stare at me for how many hours a day, right? Um, he's the one that comes up with this term. So just because you're unattractive doesn't mean you can't make important contributions to history, right? Okay, <clears throat> at the heart of all this, and I know you will want to get to the point where we can look at all the, the fancy pictures and the great, you know, sculptures and stuff like that, but... Um, the dirty little secret is whenever you have a mass of artistic flowering anywhere in world history, it's always coupled with economic expansion. Somebody's got to pay for all that oil and canvas and uh, marble and whatnot, and that's what we're going to see here. The uh, increase in trade is what's going to lead to this recovery from the Dark Ages slash Middle Ages period and the years, of course, of the plague uh, in the 1300s. This was especially true, this was the most true of the Italian city-states. This is where the trade cartels were the strongest. This is where Mediterranean was becoming kind of the epicenter, uh, and these guys had the most money. Now, other trading centers included some of these uh, large European cities and ports. This was especially true for uh, the North Sea and the Baltic states. The Hanseatic League is a good uh, example of this. <clears throat> but also, too, some of the overland trade routes are improving as well. The spread of these Renaissance ideas directly correlate to the economic improvements as a result of this trade. So when you look at where the ideas were, what was going on, and where they went out to, and then they follow exactly the lines and times of increases in trade, well, it's pretty obvious what's going on here, right? When we talk about the social changes that are taking place, it's also pretty uh, helpful to understand how this relates to Italian Renaissance ideas. The nobility, the people who are uh, close to the top but not at the top of society are really feeling a lot of pressure at this point. From the top, the monarchies are placing a lot of pressure on them, and then also from the bottom, the people that we would, in previous centuries, have called peasants, but just sort of the commoners are putting a lot of pressure on them. But the plague had really done a good job of weakening them uh, economically. Now, they had managed to hold on to uh, not as much of their own economic power, but a lot of their political power over the lower class. We're still the ones in charge, right? But from the top, monarchies began to uh, demand more and more loyalty uh, as national monarchies are growing in power. So the people are wanting more and more power from below, thanks to the economic changes that have taken place in the 1300s. And of course, the monarchies are growing in power. And so you're seeing these guys, these nobles, are kind of getting stretched from both directions. Changes in the lower classes are pretty evident at this point uh, as well. Peasants, ever increasingly, are uh, being working for wages or rent, rather than just in abject serfdom and peasantry. Uh, and in Western Europe, serfdom pretty much all that dies out. It would continue on uh, in certain fashions in Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe, we're going to see that serfdom is, is almost completely gone, right? City dwellers, these people who are living in urban environments and are engaging in much more uh, economic market activity, seeing their society ever increasingly split into more three distinct classes. Not exactly the same kind of classes that Karl Marx would use in later centuries, but still. The idea of an upper, middle, and a lower class would be pretty evident, all right? So why the Italian city-states? Why are we talking about Venice? Why are we talking about Milan? Why are we talking about these places, right? <clears throat> uh, these small commercial oligarchies are the ones that are going to dominate the Italian trading states of, of Italy. These small republics that have managed to kind of break away from the Holy Roman Empire and set themselves up along the line of essentially autonomy based around the idea that whoever has the most money, whichever family controls things, are going to control the activities of these trading cartels. <clears throat> 
they had developed some pretty highly centralized governments, and they were utilizing a number of very efficient methods for taxation. And what this did was this generated an enormous amount of wealth because through these places, we're passing all this trade of the Mediterranean. And so all they have to do is kind of harness that uh, engine and hook right up to it, and you've got a lot of cash then that's going to be able to flow into these people's coffers, right? So on the one hand, they're very controlling. If you ran afoul of a ruling family, in many cases, you were literally kicked out of the city, right? But these ruling families, while on the controlling side, there are also some uh, important patrons of arts, education, science, music. These were the guys that were paying for a lot of the great works that we now sort of go, oh, look at that, you know? Somebody paid for that. Somebody paid that artist to study, to do all the, the work and things like that. The best example, and maybe the worst example, of this is the Medici family, right? And they control the influential Republic of Florence here in Northern Italy. Uh, this is an artist rendition of what 1400s Florence may have looked like. You can see it in the, flip of the sea. Um, is nearby, the river is flowing out to it, and this gives us control as a protected seaport, and you can see how uh, powerful the city has become due to its control. The most famous of all these was Lorenzo de Medici, right? And of course, not only do we have great works of art from him, but naturally since he's paying the bills, also about him uh, as well. This is a procession of the Medicis as they're heading uh, in one of their religious processions uh, into and out of the city for one of the religious festivals there. Three-dimensional art also is going to be an important side of this where this look, you look at this and you go, oh, well, this is, this is Greek or Roman or something like that. No, it's Renaissance style where they're resurrecting a lot of these themes. And of course, then you have a bust of Lorenzo Medici himself, right? <clears throat> so what you've got is a lot of small states. They're all right next to each other and they all have tremendous amount of money. So you would think that one of the things you might see is a lot of warfare. They're always kind of getting back at each other, trying to take each other's trade uh, franchises and and trading rights and money and things like that. But what they decided to do was play for balance of power and basically just remain independent from each other. You guys do your thing, we'll do our thing, we won't fight a whole lot. Now, <clears throat> this method is going to be really, really successful until the larger, the big national monarchies of Northern and Central Europe, especially here when we talk about Spain and France, begin to intervene and overpower the area by the end of the 1400s. But what you're going to see is one of the modern uh, methods for diplomacy not super modern, you know, like now, like they're not communicating to each other with satellites or anything like that. But uh, the idea that you send out a permanent diplomat, you figure out, okay, this is what these guys are doing. You tell us what they're doing. Your diplomat would come to my capital. I can talk to you as a representative of your government. That way we can forestall wars. We can make sure that we've got uh, trade alliances, that we can talk about things before they become a huge problem. This is basically how we do things uh, now. We're also going to see that modern political... Um, Turns begin to emerge at the idea of realpolitik and you know, realistic approaches to politics. Thanks to people like Machiavelli. Uh, Machiavelli kind of gets a bad rap because a lot of people don't understand that uh, his book, The Prince, was not designed as like a blueprint, but more of a kind of a farce. Uh, but the idea that Machiavelli is er and, and other people are saying, you got to take a realistic view towards politics, uh, try to divorce yourself from just straight up uh, moral judgments on these. Whoever can help you is your friend. Whoever can hurt you is your adversary. You know those kind of things. Uh, so that's what you'll see with this. So when you look at the map, you can see how congested uh, a lot of these places are and uh, why they might be at each other's throats, but through diplomacy they were able to uh, maintain some kind of balance. So there's Machiavelli. He's really gotten kind of a bad rap. Uh, and you can see often he is at, depicted at the head of these um, sort of worldwide conspiracy theories, the Illuminati uh, at all, right? Well. <clears throat> One of the outgrowths of this that's going to be an important side is Italian humanism, right? The ideas that exist here behind the Renaissance. And you're going to have, on the artistic front, a reawakening of these classical forms of art, classical forms of music and theater. But then you couple that with the money, the patronage from the wealthy elites, and you're going to have massive, especially public, uh, art flourish and take on a number of new forms, right? This is really the exciting part, right? Italian artists are going to focus on humanism, right, which is the study of humanity. And you can see these various forms of humanism flourish uh, in two-dimensional art, paintings, etc., sculpture, three-dimensional art, music, and then also the intellectual pursuits of the age. When you look into the literary pursuits of what's going on, uh, you'll see the evidences of humanism there. Especially when we talk about the art, it'll be pretty evident for what we're going to be talking about. Right? Classical forms, generally speaking, they're updated to Renaissance daily life. And that's how you would do this. So a lot of people, uh, they have sort of this classical view of, of Jesus uh, perhaps hanging in a church that you've seen somewhere. Um, in many cases, he looks like sort of a Renaissance Italian guy, and the reason for that was some of the best, you know, uh, and classically held 
pictures of Jesus were done by these Renaissance artists who made him look like a 1400s Italian guy. So that's, that's kind of where you get a lot of this um, as our sort of classical view uh, of that comes from, just as an example to give you an idea of why things look the way that they do. Right? The study of history as a pursuit uh, to understanding of humanity begins. Right? Hard sciences also begin with naturalism, alchemy, and medicine. Medicine becomes more modern. I don't know that many of us would want to sign up for 1400s medicine, but at least we can say it's better than 1300s medicine, right? <coughs> this here is the Annunciation, right? Uh, this uh, little bit of art, and you look and say, okay, well, it's the angel, right, coming to Mary. You're going to give birth to Jesus. Clearly a religious-themed uh, painting. But when you look at this, the idea of humanism is important. When you have... Uh, how much of the frame taken up by the human figure and the human emotional activity, what's going on? This is why uh, it is a great example of Italian humanism. Now, it does have all the Renaissance hallmarks of, you know, you've got a horizon line, a light source, vanishing point, right? Three dimensional concept of space and proportion and all this photorealism. Uh, it's colorful in that regard. So you say, wow, you know, that's really, really great. Um, but it's the humanistic side that interests us, right? And so you can also have some humanistic medicine. One of the best ways to learn about the human body is as well as to cut it open, right? And so that's what you would have gone to, these large viewing chambers where they're uh, cutting open the human body and they're taking a look at what's on the inside. I don't know if it's a good idea to bring the dog maybe to a vivisection, but uh, whatever, right? <clears throat> on the literary front, when we talk about the ideas of the age, Petrarch is a great place to start, and he's very indicative of the, the literary humanists here uh, in the late 1300s. And he's going to help inspire this re-examination of these Greco-Roman, these Latin and Greek texts. And of course, this is going to people, uh, send these people who are interested in this, in these uh, sort of civic circles that are doing these readings of Petrarch, back scurrying into these old archives, which means they're going to be going to these monasteries and be trading for these old books. And this is when uh, people, for the first time in a long time, on a large scale, begin looking up you know, guys like Plato, right? Uh, and trying to get a hold of these ancient texts. Bruni is going to continue this humanism here uh, in the 1400s and the 1500s. He in, imbues it with a real sense of civic interrelationships. Who is it that's next to each other? Uh, and how do we relate to one another uh, kind of on the physical plane? But all these humanistic philosophies, they do stress this hierarchy of the universe. They're not atheistic, right? That's the more modern humanism, right? But the original divinity of man is also an incredibly important component. They stress the idea that humanity has unlimited potential. The idea that you can make yourself better, you can do whatever you need to do, you can reach just kind of to the stars. And this is an important ideological shift that humanistic philosophy is going to give us from the Italian Renaissance. So there you can see, this is a, a frontispiece from some of the humanistic uh, literature uh, of the age. Uh, the guy is talking to the angel of death over what life and death is. And so it uh, gives you kind of a view onto this. When we talk about history, much of our view of how history is supposed to operate comes from Italian humanism in the 1400s. Humanistic historians, they focused on a couple of important points. One thing that they did was they divide history into periods. They kind of started grouping things together. Now to them, you have this archaic period uh, that's barely kind of knowable, and then you have the ancient period, which was really, really awesome, right? And you have the Greeks, and you have the Romans, and then, of course, they, you get this like dark age, and you have the Middle Ages, and then, of course, they view themselves as they're in the, they're in the modern age. Um, not terribly different than the way we do it now. We might put the delineations in a little different spot, and we wouldn't call the people in the 1400s terribly modern, uh, but we would definitely uh, view ourselves as, well, we're the modern ones. Well, give it a few hundred years, and people might not think we're so modern. Uh, anymore, right? The second thing they did was utilize sources and research for trying to reconstruct events. This is something that historians now do. How do we know what happened? Who wrote about it? Who said what? Who was there as a, a primary source or a secondary source? Uh, you know, uh, who had written about it? You know, that kind of thing. So those are their concepts uh, of time. <clears throat> There's a good possibility that the most important invention of the second millennium of the 1000s, right? was done by this guy, a guy named Johannes Gutenberg. Right? Gutenberg is a German, right? And he invents the movable type printing press somewhere between the, the dates of 1445-1450. We're not exactly sure when the printing press is invented. It's not like you know, now where you just get on you know, the internet and just tell people, hey, I invented the printing press today. I mean, uh, for those of you that don't know what this is, all right, the movable type printing press is where you can in, it replace each little character on a little block, and then you've got a whole page. 
and then you can just rub it with ink and slam it down on a piece of paper. Move it, slam it down on another piece of paper, right? And that's how it works. And you can crank out pages just like that, right? It's ridiculously slow compared to anything modern that we have now, right? Uh, but compared to copying it all out by hand, and then how many hours you've got is, um, you know, one book uh, that you're trying to reproduce. This is going to massively speed up the process of publishing. It's also going to radically cut the cost down. When you're looking at a lot less time, you're also looking at a lot less money. Naturally, the first book that is going to be published and widely distributed is the Bible, right? The Bible's still, fun little side fact, the Bible's still the number one selling book in the world. It's also the number one shoplifted book in the world. So anyway. Printing technology is going to rapidly spread throughout Europe and then eventually much of the rest of the world. The number of books printed by this method between its invention in mid-century to the number of books printed by the end of the century is something like 10 million. This is ridiculously insane. All right? The reason that this is important is if you had had an idea, whoever you were, and you say, I really want to get my idea out. I really want to write it down. I really want people to read it. I want people to buy it. I want to make money off of it. Whatever it is. Well, you had to have a certain amount of capital investment. You had to pay people to sit down and write it for you. And if you didn't have that kind of money, I mean, how many copies could you really make? Uh, so it was really, really cost prohibitive to have, you know, a method to get books and ideas out there. The printing press comes along and changes all that. It becomes much, much easier for people to get your ideas out inexpensively and quickly to other people. Right? So there's Gutenberg right? going over the printing press there. Do we do a good job? Does it look okay? And then, of course, you've got one of the copies of the Gutenberg uh, Bible. <clears throat> We've mentioned briefly a little bit uh, the artistic techniques of the Renaissance. This is going to be really, really important, right? Artists are also focused on the reality of the moment. They're trying to show things uh, as they are. Perspective is an important change. When we look at some of those medieval drawings where people look to be as tall as castles, um, it's difficult to get a sense of, you know, kind of what's going on. But you also have important elements of humanity and natural detail. And the human beings become the center of subjects because this is humanistic art. When we talk about 3D art and architecture, they're both going to stress this return to classical forms. So you're going to see a lot of those Greco-Roman looking columns and uh, frontispieces and, those, and, and things like that. But it also expressed the reality and the human center uh, in terms of the concept. So we have the birth of Venus here. And I don't know that we have any actual humans in this. I mean, maybe the gal on the right. They're all Greek gods or whatnot. But the human form is an incredibly large in the frame. Now, you still have all the great you know, artistic technical detail that you're going to need. But when you look at the human form, uh, it makes a lot of, uh, it, it's obvious that that's the center of the concept here. Now, it doesn't all have to be Greek gods and goddesses. This is just as some peasant gal, right, with her uh, baby. And they're obviously not exceedingly wealthy or godly, right? At least not in the Greek kind of sense of the word. And this is a real rural area. And the guy's got his cows and, I don't know, what is that, a goose back there? So she's just hanging out. She finally got the baby to go to sleep. But when you look at how much of the frame she takes up, that humanity, in this case, humble humanity, is what's important. This was a little more busy. You have a religious theme. You've got the, the temptations of Christ by Satan, right? And there's what Jesus is up here on the cliff with Satan, and he's up at the top of the temple uh, with Satan. And then Satan's trying to get him to turn bread into rocks. But you also see this, this sort of sea of humanity. And when you look at how uh, much the frame and the activity of the people take up in this, uh, it's interesting because Jesus and Satan almost wind up kind of in the background uh, of this. But this gives you an idea of the concept of people and the human experience uh, forming the center of what they're talking about. So there's St. Jerome. He's working on, I don't know, a translation of the Bible or maybe he's just having a, maybe a deep thought. I don't know. Despite the fact that he's not a terribly interesting guy, unless you're just really into Bible history, um, he takes up a lot of the frame and his office is full of his stuff. So that gives us a good example of this. This is Christ being taken down from the cross. Again, we see a lot of religious, uh, specifically Christian, uh, themes being uh, explored. But again, it's the people. It's the people that are involved. They're upset. Jesus is crucified. They're taken down from the cross. And so uh, this gives us a good example of uh, humanism in three-dimensional art. Now, a lot of people, they see this, and they go, oh, look, it's Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's not actually necessarily why I'm showing it to you. I mean, yeah, the tower but not the leaning part. That's actually, I think, so like a, a flaw in the engineering or something. It's leaning over. Um, that's why people take pictures of it. Mostly they take pictures, you know, trying to look like they're holding it up or maybe pushing it or something like that. Um, but this is a great example of humanistic architecture where all of the pieces that interact with humans 
the walkways with all the columns, the doors with the fluted uh, edges, right? the windows with the pointed surfaces, all of that has been exaggerated. So it's humanism, and also you, you see the, the classical elements of Greco-Romanism uh, in humanistic art. Right? Well, we would be remiss to talk, about, uh, to, to talk about the Renaissance without talking about Leonardo da Vinci. He's sometimes referred to as the Renaissance man because he is so active in all the fields of intellectual advancement of the Renaissance. He's an artist, he's a writer, he's a painter, he's a thinker. Um, et cetera, et cetera, right? And his art, he's good at it, right? Uh, it reveals this heightened sense of reality and humanity, right? I uh, studied, made a number of anatomical sketches of the human body in various sort of cutaways. He was an inventor uh, of a really high degree for the 1400s. He, he invented or at least attempted to invent machines like the airplane and the tank. This is the most famous of these. I have no idea why the Mona Lisa is, is the most famous painting like in the world. Uh, it's in France. You can go and see it. And there's usually a crowd around it, and then people are constantly trying to take their picture like right next to it. I guess they and Mona Lisa are having a chat. But this is Da Vinci's, and it's actually it's pretty small. It's only like that big, I think. So it uh, looks bigger on the frame here. This is Da Vinci's painting this guy. Um, I have no idea who this guy is. Tee me up, maybe. But the reason that I included this in the show is it gives us an idea that Da Vinci was also a humanistic painter. That again, the human frame is important, what people are doing, uh, this is, a, I think it's a wall painting, um, to give you an idea of this, right? <clears throat> this here is uh, his uh, paintings here of the human body, these diagrams of uh, how this uh, moves, the Vitruvian man, and then cutaways of the human skull and brain cavity, right, uh, of these artistic um, drawings here to give you an idea of human anatomy. This is a flying wing design that he had put together, and then a couple of these, I, I don't know what these are, but these are too cool to leave out of the slides. So this looks like an overpowered sort of, I don't know, maybe fingernail clipper and then a giant hammer for killing mice. I, I don't know. But it's way too cool to leave out of the slideshow. Who put this in here, right? Seriously, that's shameful. All right. <clears throat> there are a number of important political changes that also take place here uh, during this Renaissance period that are kind of, because we talk about the intellectual background and all this art and stuff like that, that we, we sometimes lose track of. But it's important to keep track of this and, and see what's going on, right? In terms of France, France is coming out of winning the Hundred Years' War. Yay, they win the war. But yeah, France actually suffers a lot, right? Uh, because most of the war, actually pretty much all the war, was fought in France, and there's a lot of devastation. Charles II does get to be the king. You know, hooray for him. He establishes a permanent national army, which eventually is going to be a pretty big drain on the nation's resources. So those are the conclusions that they come to out of the Hundred Years' War. We win, we're right. Well, we're right about it. An army is good. Armies are also expensive. How did we get the army? Well, Charles was able to get the money that he needed to buy one. So Charles is going to weasel his way into getting full tax powers by the assembly. This is something that's going to remain relatively dormant until the late 1700s when, bada bing, bada boom, we're going to see a king with his head cut off. Not to say there's a straight line here between the 1400s and the 1700s, but there's definitely a path that takes us from here to there. England is the loser. And there are a number of economic strains that are going to be caused uh, from losing the war. And then also one of the major fallouts is a civil war. Who's to blame uh, for what this disaster in France uh, had, had caused to happen, right? This is called the War of the Roses, Lancaster versus York, and then actually it goes multi-generational, and it's a little too confusing to even keep track of, right? The long story short is one family, the Tudor dynasty, is going to win the civil war. And their first king is Henry VII. Their conclusion that they come to out of the Hundred Years' War and the War of the Roses is the permanent armies are a problem. They get rid of them, right? We'll call up the militia or something if we have an invasion. And they basically seek to steer clear of a number of wars via diplomacy. This is actually going to put England in an interesting spot a little bit later on because they're going to focus on commercial interests and going into trading uh, with people around the world via their navy. Spain is going to be ending its own civil war of sorts, one that had lasted for about 700 years. That's this Reconquista, right? This Reconquest from Islam. Islam had invaded uh, the I Iberian Peninsula in the 700s, and it's going to begin to really, really recede with the dynastic marriage between Ferdinand and Isabella, right, of Leon and Castile in 1469. These guys are able to bring most of the Christian forces now all under one banner. They stop fighting with each other, and the Islamic forces, which had already been kind of in retrograde motion, anyway, are now going to get pushed really, really hard. They finally defeat the last of the Muslim kingdoms. This was at Granada 
1492, just a few months before Columbus is going to leave on his voyage across the Atlantic. They also then begin this hardcore inquisition practices to try to discover the number of Jews and or unconverted Muslims that are living inside Spain. This is going to lead to a number of terror and people being burned alive and executed in public if they don't recant and turn back to Christianity. So this is what you'd see. These hearings, these people, that they are brought out and they are put on trial and then they are set on fire. And a lot of people are tortured into confessing. Soles of their feet being burned, hung from the ceiling from uh, shackles, being stretched out on the rack, having uh, knives driven into their kneecaps. Well, I think you guys get the idea of public burnings and execution. <clears throat> In terms of the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs maintained their uh, situation, but they remain relatively powerless. They're in charge, but there's not a whole lot that they can do because the local princes maintain control. However, what you're going to see is their power grows around the world due to a number of dynastic marriages. They marry the right people at the right time. To give you an idea of this, by 1519, Charles was the emperor of Germany, Burgundy, and Spain. And of course, that means that by 1521, with Cortez's conquest of Mexico, this guy has conquered like a quarter of the earth just by being married to the right people. The Byzantine Empire here in Western Asia, they're going to die, right? By 1453, they're all, uh, they're completely surrounded by the Ottoman uh, Turks, and all that's left is the city of Constantinople itself. And finally, that's the year when Constantinople is going to fall, right? The Turks are going to overwhelm the fortress city, uh, and the region that had been Greek since, uh, you know, centuries before Christ is going to lose its Greek identity and, of course, had been Christian uh, since the first century and second century uh, AD. They're going to lose this Greek Christian identity forever. So if you go into what was uh, Western Anatolia, this Ionia area, no, it is not going to be anything like what it is now. Uh, this is one of the Habsburg emperors. It's really sort of unfortunate what not marrying outside your family might do to you. <clears throat> and then this is the siege of Constantinople itself where you can see the Turkish army and the Turkish navy surrounding the city until eventually... Uh, it is forced to surrender, right? Now, papal power had undergone a significant loss uh, in previous centuries, in part due to the Avignon Papacy, a number of popes that were all sort of running around claiming to have uh, power. They do manage to reconstitute themselves into a single line uh, by the 1400s, but now they're suffering from uh, the real problems of worldliness. Uh, the popes were getting involved in a number of really non-church kind of activities. Popes led troops in war. They also were engaged in the, pro uh, the process of simony, which is the sale of kind of church offices to the highest bidder. They built ever-increasingly extravagant homes for themselves. They, it, they appointed relatives to high positions. Uh, the, po the popes tore down the old St. Peter's Basilica and began a new construction on what they hoped would be the greatest structure in all Christendom, right? Some people begin to question this authority and abuse. You'll see that Wycliffe, for example, in England, he produced his own Bible in English, and he gets condemned for it. Right? The Czech, Jan Hus, brought forth a number of uh, reforms that the church needed to make about papal excesses and also some theological changes that needed to take place within the Catholic Church. So the popes, they called them to, okay, well, that's, those are some good ideas you got there. Hus, let's, call, let's get together at a meeting, and we'll talk about it. Well, when he shows up to the meeting, they declare him a heretic, and then they burn him alive. So this is St. Peter's with the roof torn off of it. Uh, it's going to be kind of expensive to fix, and as we'll, we see when we get together next time, uh, where they go to get it fixed is going to cause a pretty strong reaction against the Renaissance-era Italian papacy. 